Good morning. And let me say Happy New Year to you because it is a new year. And I am thankful for that. But personally, there were so many blessings in my life that was taken from last year, though there were so many struggles and challenges for so many people. I want to begin this morning just by saying what a beautiful crowd we have this morning. Despite what your husband or wife told you this morning, you're beautiful to me. And I want you to know that it's beautiful in the eyes of God for you to be here and to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And there are a few faces that I see this morning that we normally don't get to see. And I want to say how very thankful I am that you have chosen or are able to come our way. You know, I was reading some statistics this week, and I don't typically read statistics unless I'm preparing for a sermon. And these particular statistics suggested, and I'm being very general with these numbers for the sake of simplicity, that the average American watches about three hours of television a day. And then I remembered on any given Saturday, I might watch about nine hours of television because of football. The average American seems to be on social media about the same amount of time, about three hours a day. And the average American is on their smartphone somewhere between five and seven hours a day. We know that number because most smartphones keep up with that number. And they try to monitor it to encourage us to use it more or less, but it is a constant addiction for most of us. And so reviewing, we watch about three hours of television a day. We're on social media about three hours a day. I know there's many people this doesn't apply to. And we're uh, on the uh, internet or on our smartphones about six hours a day. You know what the average number of those... I'm not talking about the average American, nor am I talking about the average churchgoer, but the person who reports that they read the Bible every day... You know how much they say they spend time reading the Bible every day? An average of three to five minutes. Now there's a little bit of a discrepancy there, isn't there? Now I think I know why we're spending hours upon hours on television and smartphones and social media and just squeezing in a few minutes of Bible reading. I think I know that and it has to do in part with psychology because when we do certain functions in this life, it releases endorphins in our brain and some things in this life releases more endorphins than others. For example, if I eat junk food, it releases more endorphins as if I'm eating a bowl of carrots. That's just the truth behind the matter. If I'm watching television, it releases more endorphins as if I'm, than if I'm learning a new subject. And so what happens is if we fill our mind with constant endorphins, we become so accustomed to this that now taking a walk or having a simple discussion or reading a book or learning a new subject or eating a healthy meal, those things don't quite do it for us anymore because we overload our brain on endorphin rushes. Does that make sense? And so for that reason, practically all of us are trained every day to be more involved in the things that are often unhealthy for us. Eating junk food and, and spending time on TV and so on and so forth. And so what that means is that when we have a harder and harder time today in 2021 than we did say in 1950 about being good Bible students, there is literally a, a psychological and, and medical answer to that question of why. And it actually is harder for us to learn subjects and harder for us to read books today unless we're one of those people that get a high endorphin rush from reading a book than it has ever been. And so I've got to admit that reality. On the other hand, is it not also true that we will ultimately do the things that we really want to do? There are things that are not so easy. It's not easy to eat healthy. It's not easy to lose weight. It's not easy to, to be practical with our spending. It's not always easy to control our emotions. But those are things we have to do if we're going to live a healthy life, isn't it? 
And so I suggest this morning, and I don't even know if I introduced the subject, but here it is. I want to give you 12 practical but biblical reasons why I want you to consider being a daily Bible reader and studier this new year. Okay? And so because there's 12 of them, we'll jump right into it. And I'll just say this, that... At the end of our study, if I can remember, I want to show you at least two practical suggestions of what I would like you to consider to be a daily Bible reader or a daily Bible studier. And there is a way that we can read our Bibles through in an entire year with about 15 minutes of dedication a day. I think all of us are capable of that, aren't we? Fifteen minutes a day, there is a Bible reading program that, that's been out there for years and years and years. It's called the, the what is it called? The One Year Bible Reading Program. And I want to show you at the end of our study via software on the smartphone how you might be able to access that. Maybe I won't forget that. Let's jump into point number one, and I'm going to spit a lot of Bible verses at you, so if you want to, you can take notes. In Psalm 119, in verse 105, the Bible says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Reason number one why I would like to suggest that we strongly commit to doing that which we're not naturally desiring to do is be daily Bible readers in this new year is because we live in a dark world. There is a lot of darkness all around us. If 2020 showed us nothing else, we learn just how dark society can be. It seems as though we are divided politically and socially and economically and in so many ways. And in this year, I was reminded just how much darkness exists in this world and how much hate exists in this world and how confusing it can be for our young people and for us adults alike to navigate the, 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 this difficult thing we call life. And yet I'm reminded that the only way I can have light in a dark world is by opening up my Bible and reading it and studying it. And it is a blueprint. It is a map. It is a set of directions and if I follow the values that are laid out in the Bible and the principles, I can have a clear vision of what successful living looks like. I can have a clear path to that wonderful place called heaven above. And I want to say this now and I might say it again later, then I think sometimes here's the misconception. Someone sitting there thinking, preacher, I know the Bible's good. I know the Bible's helpful. If I'm trying to organize a church, the Bible shows me how to do it. If I'm trying to have a biblical worship service, I know the Bible tells us how to do that. If I'm trying to be saved, I know the Bible's where I go. But folks, I think somewhere along the way we have begun to think that the Bible is only good for theological matters only. But I want you to know that the Bible is useful in matters of, of general church and religion and organization of the church, but it's also good for me on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and on down the list. If I want to have a better marriage, the Bible is the best source to go to. If I want to be a better parent, the Bible is the best set of instructions that I have. If I want to be a better employee or a better employer, the Bible gives me direction on that. If I want to be a better citizen, if I just want to be a better person, if I want to learn to control my tongue and fight temptations, there is no better book than the book we call the Bible. And so in this dark and dismal world, we need light. We need a light that we can shine on the path so we're not stepping on snakes, so that we're not stumbling on rocks, so that we're not veering off the path that we are on. We need light, and that light, according to David, long ago was this book we call the Bible. Point number two, a second reason why I want us to consider reading and studying our Bibles every day is because God's Word equips us for every good work. Here's the reality. We know that God asks a lot of us. We know that as Christians we have responsibilities. We know that as citizens of the human race, we are tasked to, be, to, to, to create a better world and environment than, than what we were left with, not a worse one. 
And so if, if I'm trying to meet all of these obligations and all of these responsibilities and do all of these good works, sometimes I'm left wondering, and by the way, I can use a personal illustration here, something I'm still learning as a parent is I will often tell my children, do this, wash the dishes, do this, clean your room, do this, take care of the yard. And sometimes what I forget to do as a parent, which is so crucial, is I forget to tell them how to do it. And when I walk outside and I'm, and I'm amazed at, at the lack of productivity, sometimes in my honesty I have to admit, wait a minute, they've never been taught how to do this. You see, God is not asking us something to do. To, God is not asking us to do something and then leaving it up to us to figure out how to do it. You see, the Bible says in passages like 2 Timothy 3, particularly verses 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We'll come back to those details later. But notice this point in verse 17, that the man of God may be complete, that is, that the man of God may be fully mature just as God intended that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In short, what the Bible is saying is that God does not ask us to do anything that His Word does not fully train and equip us to do. Therefore, if I want to meet my obligations and responsibilities successfully, I will be a person who reads and studies the Bible as often as I can. Point number three. Point number three for reasons why I should read and study my Bible every day is this, that God's Word provides us with spiritual nourishment. The Bible says when Jesus was being tempted in Matthew chapter 4 and verse number 4, when Satan came and tempted him and said, you've been without food 40 days, won't you just take those stones lying over there and turn them into loaves of bread and eat them? I'll tell you this, that nothing tempts me more than freshly baked bread. Now, she may be listening, and I want to give her credit. I had started a diet a few weeks ago, and about an hour after I felt good about being successful, concluding one day, a lovely sister in Christ, Joan Hart, brings over fresh... Sourdough bread still warm from the oven. I'll tell you what, folks, I'm not strong enough to pass that up. And I think that reveals just a little bit how, how that can be a temptation for our Lord in the wilderness. And in response to Jesus, who avoided and successfully met that challenge, he said this in response to the devil in Matthew 4 and verse 4. He said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, underline it, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I'm telling you folks, as important as it is to eat and to be healthy with our diets, and as, in, as important as it is not to go days upon days upon days upon days without nourishing our body, it is so much more important to nourish our spiritual beings by ingesting the Word of God. Jesus would say this one chapter later in Matthew 5 and verse 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, He would say, Blessed are those, underline it, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This reminds me of two illustrations. The first one, and excuse me if I get the precise characters incorrect, but long ago, those, uh, what was it? It was either Plato or Aristotle, one of those. They had a student that was just amazed at the amount of knowledge and understanding and wisdom that they felt that they had. And they were bugging them all the time. How can I learn as much as you? How can I grow to be as knowledgeable as you? How can I one day be as wise as you? And, and Plato or Aristotle, whichever one it was, Socrates, one of those guys, he took him over to the banks of the river and he aggressively grabbed him by the neck and held his head under water for what seemed to be way too long to be funny. And when the man came up just huffing and puffing and almost drowned, he says, until you crave knowledge and understanding and truth as much as you crave the oxygen while under that river, you won't be where I'm at. It reminds me of Brother Guy in Woods who completed a gospel meeting 
who on one occasion it is said that at the end of the service he was standing at the back of the door. He was a preacher in the Church of Christ of years past and he was shaking hands as preachers would often do. And one of the brothers came out and was just so impressed with Brother Wood's knowledge of the Scriptures. And he said, Brother Woods, I'd give my life to know the Bible as well as you. And Brother Woods calmly and humbly said, that's exactly what it cost me to have this amount of knowledge. I'm telling you folks, we need to hunger and thirst and crave and look for every opportunity to know more truth because knowing truth brings freedom. Knowing truth brings us closer to God. And knowing truth gives us a relationship with God where we are less and less impressed with the foolishness of this world and more and more and more impressed with the simplicity of the teachings of the gospel. And so may I hunger and thirst for righteousness. The Bible says this in 1 Peter 2 and verse number 2, As newborn babes desire, long for, the sincere milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. We need to grow, and if our intention is to grow, we cannot do so away from God's Word. Point four, and hurriedly, God's Word confirms or denies the things that I have been taught. I want to propose a question. Why do you believe religiously the things that you believe? Why do I believe religiously the things that I have come to believe? And I often ask that question in personal Bible discussions and studies, and here's some of the more popular answers I'm given. Well, my mom and dad taught me to believe this. Or my grandma and grandpa, they taught me that such and such was true or that it was not true. I don't care if you're raised in the church of Christ or in a, a, a denominational church or in any religion. I just want to say this, that the reason for why we believe what we believe should not be an infallible or should not be a fallible person. It should not be a feeling or an intuition or a, quote, nudging of the heart. It should always be based on a thus says the Lord. It should always be backed up with Bible truth. If the preacher, let's say that there is some preacher somewhere that you just really love, you really respect, you really look up to, you think he's something else, don't take his word for it. Don't take his word for it. I remember coming out of services one day a few years ago where I was preaching and I heard a brother and a sister having a Bible discussion. And the brother says, well, that's not what TJ said. And then I walked right over to him and I said, it don't matter what TJ said. TJ's wrong all the time. That's true, folks. May we go to God's Word and search the Scriptures to know whether or not the things we believe are indeed truth. In Acts 17, verse number 11, that's what the early Christians did. The Bible said that these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that, they, in that they received the Word with all readiness and they searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether or not these things were so. Point number five. God's Word warns us of certain dangers. Of course, in Psalm 19, the Bible is referred to as law, as testimonies, as statutes, as commandments, and as judgments. And in Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11, particularly verse number 11, the Bible says, Moreover, by them, the laws, the testimonies, the commandments, your servant is warned. And keep this in mind, that the Bible warns us that temptations will come our way, right? The Bible warns us of the sin of loving money and materialism. The Bible warns us of the sin of worldliness and worldly influences. The Bible warns us of false teachers. It warns us about having this mindset of thinking we're too good to fall. Remember that passage that says, Take heed lest you fall. We might go to church every week. We might put on a suit. We might be on certain teams. We might be a deacon or a deacon's wife or an elder or an elder's wife or a preacher or a preacher's wife. Folks, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, any one of us can be so filled with pride that we are liable to fall if we're not careful. And so the Bible warns us, I need warnings, don't you? I need warnings. I enjoy that mobile warning you get when you have a big amount of money that leaves your checking account because sometimes it's not you that's taking it. I enjoy that warning. 
I enjoy the warning that says, Hey, did you forget you had an electric bill? Oh, wait, I did forget that. Let's go pay that. I enjoy warnings. They are helpful to us. Point number six, God's Word gives us the ammunition we need to combat the temptations of the devil. In Psalm 119, verse number 11, David says this, and I find it so very fascinating. He says to God, he says, Your word have I hidden in my heart. The biblical heart is the mind, not just the feeling. It's the thought processes. He says, Your word have I hidden in my heart. Why, David? That I might not sin against you. Here's the reality. We're all tempted. Here's the reality we've all sinned. But here is also the reality that we don't have to sin at every temptation. We don't have to give in. Jesus taught us that. And so David says, the absolute best way I can prevent myself from falling and going back into darkness and living in sin again is to spend time in the Word, hide it away in my heart. That way it's there. And here's the way that works practically. If I'm tempted to start loving money... Bible verse pops into my mind. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. If I start being tempted, if you will, to be lazy, Bible verse pops into my mind. That without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. You see, in every aspect of life, if we're reading and studying our Bible daily, the Bible will kick in and remind us of principles that we build our life upon that lead us to greater success now and a healthier relationship with God in the long run. And then, of course, in Matthew chapter 4, even Jesus was tempted as we already talked about. And with each of those temptations, what did Jesus say in direct response to Satan? He said, It is written. That which is written was written was important to Jesus and it certainly will be the secret to us overcoming temptations. Point number seven. God's Word gives us discernment. Particularly discernment of our own thoughts and our own intents and our own motives. Because sometimes we can lie to ourselves. And here's what the Bible says in Hebrews 4 and verse number 12. For the Word of God is living. Don't forget this is a living document. It's not a dead, outdated document. For the Word of God is living and it is powerful. Folks, I went from living to sin to living from the Lord for the Lord because of this powerful book called the Bible. I have seen people give up a life of drug and alcohol abuse and crime and become even leaders in the local church because this book is just that powerful. I've seen marriages saved. I've seen relationships restored. I've seen good things happen time after time after time. Don't forget the power of this book. And on that day when I don't have the energy or the motivation or I would rather flip on the news or get on social media, may I not let Satan win and convince me to walk away from the most powerful help that I have in my life for success and direction. This book is that important. And so he says, It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, underline it, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And of course, it helps me to discern myself. And it helps me to discern others. For instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, we are to judge preachers and teachers and quote prophets of their day by the fruits that they bear. It helps us to discern others as well. Point number eight. I must strive to read and study my Bible every day because eight, God's Word convicts me of my sins and that's okay. I don't want a doctor to be so timid and shy that when they see cancer is living in my body, they don't have the backbone to stand there and tell me in love that I have cancer. Do you want that kind of doctor? Nor do I want that type of preacher. Nor do I want to be that type of Christian. We do have sin that we must confront. And in 2 Timothy 3.16, again, all Scripture is given through the inspiration of God and is profitable. Key on on that word profitable. It is profitable means it is useful. 
That is, it is practically useful in my day-to-day -day life, and that needs to be stated as well. And so with that being said, what is it useful for? It is useful for, underline it, doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. In that the Word of God is useful for doctrine, the Word of God is the only source that teaches me religious doctrine that is right. It's the only source. In that the Word of God is useful for reproof, it is the Word of God that shows me when I am not right. In that the Word of God is useful for correction, it is the Word of God that helps me to get right. And in that the Word of God is useful for instruction, it is the Word of God that will help me to stay right. Point number nine. And by the way, by illustration, before we move on, in James chapter 1, 22 through 25, James says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If any man is a doer, a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man, and I'm paraphrasing, who looks in a mirror, sees a blemish on his face. He doesn't deal with the blemish, but he walks away and thinks out of sight, out of mind. The word of God is our mirror. If I view into the Word of God on a regular basis, I will see if I'm lazy, if I'm a liar, if I'm a gossiper, if I'm a hypocrite. And when I see that, it might be uncomfortable, but the fact that I see it means I can start doing something about it. And so the Word of God does that. Point number nine, God's Word has the power to save us from our sins. Here's the short verse. Romans 1.16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, what's it say, church family, is the power of God unto what? Salvation. I want you to know this, folks. If you want to know what to do to be saved, it isn't some plan that I'm clever enough to invent, write down and tell you. Separate from the Word of God, there is no scholar, no preacher, no commentator, no church father that can give you that information separate from the Word of God. If I truly want to know what I need to do to be saved from my sins, it is only found in the gospel, the Word of God. And of course, those steps are have faith... John 8, 24, repent or repent of my sins. Uh, Acts 17, 30, confess the name of Jesus. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, and be baptized into Christ. Mark 16, 16. And so the Word of God brings salvation and the steps of salvation makes it clear in my life. Point 10. God's Word reminds me of the promises of God. In short, God promised through His Son that one day His Son would come back. In John chapter 14, 1 through 3, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, notice what He says, I will come again. I'm looking forward to that, brothers and sisters. And when God makes a promise, He will keep it every time. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God promised us that I will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able to bear, but in the hour of your temptation, I will give you a way of escape. Glory to God, I have that promise. I'm promised in Hebrews 13, verse 5, by God when He says that I will never leave you nor will I forsake you. There are days I need to be reminded of that promise. How would I know those promises if it were not for this book? And how would I receive such hope? Point number 11. God's Word will be the standard by which we will all be judged one day. John 12 verse 48. In the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge you in that last day. I've said it this way before, but I'll say it again. We often look at Judgment Day as the day we show up to take that final exam. No, folks, we're taking that final exam right now in this time we call life. And when we stand before the Lord come Judgment Day, we will not be taking a test. We will be given the results to that test we're taking right now. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is merciful. But He expects us to study the study guide and live according to it. The one He has given, the Bible. Here's the final point. God's Word never changes. Politics change. Governments change. Hairstyles change. Fashion changes. That which is trendy changes. Everything changes and it goes through cycles. Religions change. Denominational doctrines change. Everything changes. But Jesus said this regarding His Word, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but My words will by no means pass away. 
even when this earth is ablaze, and the Lord is in the sky with His mighty host of angels, and everything in the material realm will be burnt up with fervent heat, according to 2 Peter, even when that happens, truth will still be truth. The money that I may have loved, it's burned up. The house that I loved, it will be burned up. All of the things in this life I held dear that are not spiritual in nature, it will be done away. But the truth that I dedicated my life to reading and studying every day and living and teaching and building my life upon, it will be eternal. And when we're in heaven with God Almighty doing whatever He has for, in, for us in store, truth will still be truth. And that, dear friends, is something worth spending time in. I think it was somebody who said earlier that TJ said we could go another two hours. Surprised I got 12 points in, but uh, you're listening so well, maybe we could go another two more hours. I want to do this. I don't have time. We'll do it personally if you're interested. But go and look at two options I would recommend if you already don't have a Bible reading program. There's two things. If you read... If you study, and I want to use that word study, if you study one chapter of the New Testament five days a week, that's taking Wednesdays off and Sundays off if you choose to do that, you can not read but study through the entire New Testament in one calendar year. That's pretty good, isn't it? And if you want to limit that to a, say, a 15 or 20 minute period of time, let's say it takes five minutes to read that chapter, now spend about 15 or so minutes taking notes, making some observations, applying it to your life, keep it in a journal, and you can go back and read it before your next study. That's one approach. Another approach is something that we call the... Um Let's see what it's called. It is called the One Year Bible. If you have the YouVersion Bible app, what you can do... And let me just show you this real quickly. Can I do that? Um, it, many of you have this app. It's one of the more common Bible apps out there. And uh, if I can get this to work here... Give me a minute. All right, there it is. All right, so if you go to this, you see this uh, Bible app right here that I clicked on? Let me go back to it. See the Holy Bible? It's a lot of mess. So you click on that. Instead of going to reading, you're going to go to plans, which is the third over. And you can choose any Bible plans you want to, but at the top you can see the one-year Bible reading plan. What they advertise is you can read the entire Bible a variety each day in 15 minutes or so a day. And so day one looks like that. You see, I did it. Day two looks like that. You see, I did it. Here's a day that hasn't been completed, which is today. And if you click on it, if you're using a translation that has an, audio, an audio Bible available, like the English Standard Version, for instance, then what you can do is you can read it while you listen to it. I'm not going to play it now. And put it on whatever speed you want to. And I've been able to get all of this Bible reading done in about 10 to 15 minutes a day. Now here's what I want you to notice. You're getting a chapter or two from the Old Testament, a chapter or a little more from the New Testament, and you're reading a little bit of Psalms and a little bit of Proverbs every day. And in about 15 minutes time, you can read the entire Bible in a year. And it keeps up with your progress for you. Now if that is helpful, I'm only giving you that practical piece of advice because... It's one thing to stand up here and say, here's all the reasons we should read it. But I wanted to steer someone who may need the help in the right direction. Just know this, brothers and sisters. Some people don't read and study the Bible because they think the Bible has contradictions. I am suggest most people don't read and study the Bible because the Bible contradicts their life. If we read and study the Bible and it's uncomfortable, see that as a growing process. If we read and study the Bible and we find it challenging, see that as a step in the right direction to grow and be closer to God. Because if I decide I'm going to run a 5K or a 10K this year, that first mile or two, if I'm not used to running, is going to be rather uncomfortable, isn't it? But the more I do it, the more natural it becomes. May we dedicate our lives to reading and studying God's Word. If you're here and want to begin this new year in a right relationship with God, we invite you to do that as we stand and as we sing. Jesus is standing in the Pilots all.